So continuing with the theme of frontal temporal dementia, our ne next speaker is Dr. Mendez. He's a behavioral neurologist and professor of neurology and psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences at the Dave and Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He has been the director of the neuro uh, neurobehavior at the VA in greater Los Angeles since 1984. He's an expert clinician, educator, and research and receives clinical referrals from around the world and has been featured in the uh, Los Angeles Times. He has received several education awards and directs the uh, VAGA UCLA Fellowship in Behavioral uh, Neurology and Neuropsychiatry and has over 200 publications as well as authoring several books. So thank you, Dr. Mendez. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. LaPerla. I want to thank you and the organizers for inviting me. And uh, you didn't say what I was featured in the LA Times for. Uh, and actually, I wanted, in, I wanted to say in terms of disclosures, I have no disclosures. I have no recent uh, felony convictions. Uh, my, my research is uh, funded by the uh, National Institutes of Health and, uh, fortunately, the VA Merit Review System. So I want to talk to you today about social behavior and emotion in frontotemporal dementia. And in the time that I have, uh, I think my main purpose, my main goal, is to make you aware that this is a disease of the social brain and that these patients present with alterations in social behavior in midlife. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what that constitutes, but that's uh, the take-home message of this discussion. Uh, these patients often go from uh, one clinician to another, from psychiatrist uh, to psychologist uh, to neurologist, with a, a midlife crisis and depression and adjustment disorder and uh, sometimes psychosis uh, before people actually realize that there's an underlying uh, brain disease at the macromolecular level. Um, so, uh, let's put this in the context of early onset dementias, those that occur before the age of 65. Uh, this is uh, from uh, our clinic experience. Uh, and as you can see, only about a third of patients uh, below the age of 65 have a new onset dementia, uh, in our program at least. Uh, but this is uh, replicated uh, more or less uh, with varying degrees of variance across the world. Only about a third uh, have uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and about 15 to 20 percent have a, a frontotemporal dementia spectrum. Now, I'm going to focus then today, now, on the behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, expand on uh, what uh, Adam uh, discussed in terms of the basic science, and uh, fortunately we have uh, Mary Lou Gorno Tempini uh, here today who will tell us about the uh, language uh, variants. Uh, okay, let's start with the new international consensus criteria introduced uh, last year. We all got together and came up with new criteria. And so I want you to, real, uh, to note that these criteria focus on a behavioral change, a pervasive behavioral change, uh, which is characterized by disturbances in social behavior. A, early behavioral disinhibition, socially inappropriate behavior, loss of manners or decorum, impulsive, rash, or careless actions. Now, what does that constitute? Well, all of a sudden, uh, you have uh, somebody who's prim and proper and socially uh, conservative uh, in their behavior, and, uh, you know, uh, they uh, uh, start uh, talking to strangers, any strangers, uh, uh, strange strangers, uh, strangers <laughs> off the street. Uh, uh, for example, I have a patient the other day uh, who, you know, uh, saw uh, the person who came in to uh, fix the water heater, and uh, he uh, promptly kissed him, uh, which uh, it wasn't ordinarily his uh, usual pattern of behavior. This constituted a change, um, and the family was a bit concerned. Um, early loss of sympathy or empathy is another big uh, disturbance. Um, loss of embarrassability, loss of concern. Um, I'll never forget one of my first patients uh, who is uh, a, I mean, a, all of his life a very loving man with a, a family uh, and uh, uh, very oriented to his, to his family. Uh, his wife developed a, a breast cancer and she was hospitalized. He did not go to visit her. Uh, he did not call her. 
And then one day he did call her because he wanted to know where the potato chips were in the kitchen. Uh, she was devastated. Uh, and believe it or not, this was one of the first clues that the patient had a frontotemporal dementia. Um, impulsive and uh, repetitive uh, behaviors, uh, uh, hyperoral and dietary changes, um, and uh, a neuropsychological profile which emphasizes uh, executive function disturbances. Uh, so, just some quick pictures. Uh, you can see that uh, this is an exaggerated uh, uh, advanced uh, patient, but uh, makes the point uh, that uh, there is disproportionate atrophy of the frontal, frontal and anterior temporal regions, as there is uh, if you look at FTG uh, PET uh, metabolism, uh, there is a eventual wipeout of the frontal regions. And uh, this is from uh, some of our work on tensor-based uh, uh, morphometry, showing in purple the medial uh, frontal uh, regions that are involved in uh, pointing out that this is the region uh, that where this is the center of social brain, the so, uh, social behavior. Now, um, just a, a little kind of editorial. Um, humans um, don't come endowed with uh, a lot of intrinsic defenses and abilities uh, in comparison to other primates or in even comparison to uh, other uh, aggressive mammals. And so a lot of uh, the history of uh, human evolution has to do with s surviving as social groups, social groups uh, where we can have cooperative, collaborative uh, relationships, uh, sharing of information, uh, and working together uh, to overcome obstacles uh, from food gathering to rearing uh, communal rearing of young and so on, it does take a village. And so it is, should be of no surprise that a lot of the brain, a lot of the uh, certain parts of the brain, that frontal region that has so disproportionately en enlarged uh, in humans, uh, has a dedicated role in social behavior. So um, FTD and social and emotional behavior, uh, the social feelings are instinctive or innate in the lower animals. So why should they not be so in man, um, just to put it into uh, evolutionary uh, context? And this is, these are the regions that we're talking about. This is Ralph Adolph's uh, across town uh, at uh, Caltech. Uh. Okay, so the main social and emotional uh, changes uh, that we see, I have uh, grouped here into two uh, easy to remember categories. One is social, socio-emotional detachment, decreased self-referential social behavior, uh, decreased emotional awareness of others, s empathy, sympathy, and uh, a lack of uh, moral emotional expression. Um, in addition, there's a dysregulation of so social and moral behavior such that they will do things like public expression of private acts. I don't, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I, I had, a, I had a, another uh, man who was, uh, again, he had two, two daughters. Uh, they were uh, teenage, uh, young teenage daughters, 13 or 14. And uh, he went to school to pick one up. Uh, and uh, in front of the, her friends, uh, he passed gas. He didn't excuse himself. He didn't look embarrassed. And, but his daughter was totally, totally upset. And this brought him to us, to medical attention. <laughs> Passing gas. So they do violate uh, interpersonal boundaries, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, and uh, I have a patient who likes to rub the hair of, uh, uh, of hairy men and uh, will sit in the waiting room and try to rub the arms of the hair and the arms of uh, people. And, and at one time she was sitting there staring at me and she lunged at my eyebrows. <laughs> so the, this, uh, these are dramatic examples, but I think the point is that they can be insidious and gradual and more, much more subtle. So it's up to you to have your antennas up for these behavioral changes and not assume that it's some kind of midlife crisis. 
Uh, the literature reflects the following. There's some uh, chance of crossing uh, legal boundaries uh, in terms of uh, what some people have termed sociopathy, acquired sociopathy, uh, a debatable term and not meant to be pejorative here. Um, decreased understanding of social concepts, de decreased self-referential emotions such as no embarrassability, decreased recognition of facial emotions, uh, decreased uh, empathy, uh, decreased theory of mind, and decreased recognition of the humanness of others. And these are uh, references uh, to um, my colleagues uh, who've done this uh, great work. Um, decreased recognition of uh, facial emotions, uh, uh, this is the beginning of, social, uh, of a social interaction, is to recognize social cues. And much of uh, social signaling comes from facial uh, expressivity and facial emotions. And uh, there's a problem there, so that they don't recognize what's going on. Um, uh, and uh, this is a normal uh, performance. This is how an FTD uh, patient will perform. Often negative emotions, such as disgust, uh, fear and anger are particularly disturbed, uh, and as you can see, this is not the case with Alzheimer's disease. Um, now, for the rest of my time, I want to talk about uh, five specific socio-emotional areas. Uh, I think I have some time to talk a little bit about, uh, focus a little bit. Um, uh, I want to talk about the social marker hypothesis, uh, you know, colleagues across town that I've done some work with. Uh, uh, Antoine uh, de Cara and uh, uh, Antonio Damasio, who talked about the somatic marker hypothesis. I want to talk a little bit about empathy, theory of mind, and what, what uh, some of us discuss as the threat alarm system. First of all, uh, this somatic marker hypothesis is a, is a rather a, uh, an elaboration, in, in a way, of the uh, old uh, James Lang theory of emotion, and that is that you have a perception, and that perception uh, triggers a body states. Uh, you're, you know, uh, I get this feeling in the pit of my stomach when I'm afraid, my hands get sh uh, uh, sweaty, uh, the exocrine sympathetic uh, system starts acting up, and then we uh, I realize that all of this is going on, and then I tell myself, uh, you know, you're, you're anxious or you're afraid. Um, now, uh, the somatic marker hypothesis elaborates uh, on that in that uh, these uh, states are reconstituted in that part of the social brain that I talked to you about, particularly the ventromedial frontal uh, cortex and its related uh, area, areas. So what you have, and this is a, a picture from uh, uh, Gazaniga's book, it shows uh, that uh, when, when uh, you have an anticipation, that there's no anticipation in these patients. Uh, they don't have any uh, premonitory uh, feeling. They don't have those somatic uh, markers, so they have nothing to interpret. Hence, they don't have the emotions necessary for social behavior. The th second thing is the issue of empathy, which is really the ability to vicariously experience uh, what others are feeling, as opposed to sympathy, which really has a technically different uh, interpretation. Uh, uh, if you dissect these words are from Greek, uh, empathy with feeling. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is particularly uh, disturbed because the cognitive aspects of it are centered in that ventromedial uh, region of the brain, which is affected uh, in frontotemporal dementia behavioral variant. Uh, and also there is disturbance uh, of the abil ability to experience emotion as an emotional contagion. So empathy is disturbed. Third uh, is the issue of theory of mind, and that's the ability to represent others' thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, and feelings. And this is uh, one of the most important concepts in all of social cognition. That is that you, uh, in interacting with others, know that they have their own feelings, their own thoughts, their own beliefs. They're not inanimate. Um, and in, in the appreciation of that, uh, you recognize that you are dealing with a conspecific, another human being, and this is critical to the social brain. We know that this has been most studied in uh, autism and uh, also in patients who have had frontal lesions, focal frontal lesions. 
Well, the theory of mind at various levels uh, is uh, particularly disturbed uh, in uh, frontotemporal dementia. And so they, they, in addition to this inability to uh, experience the somatic feelings from an interaction and to experience empathy, now you see that they, don't, they may even have a decrease in the ability to appreciate that the person they're interacting with has thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. Um, and uh, uh, as you can see from uh, the, these uh, imaging studies, uh, these areas uh, are uh, particularly not, confi are not confined uh, to the frontal regions, but they do involve that uh, ventral medial region uh, affected in, uh, in frontotemporal dementia. And uh, just, uh, this is a Sally Ann paradigm. I don't need, know if I need to go through it unless you don't know very much about theory of mind, but you know, uh, there's Sally and there's Ann, and uh, Ann puts her uh, doll in the carriage. Sally sees it, uh, Ann leaves, uh, and while she's gone, Sally, a sneaky little girl that she is, uh, moves that doll into the toy box. So the question is to the patient, to the patient with frontotemporal dementia, where will Anne look for the doll when she comes back? Well, what is your answer? Well, where is she going to look? She's going to look. Oh, I got to check. <laughs> I'm wondering about the. <laughs> she's going to look in the. <laughs> she's going to look in the carriage where she left it. Uh, but a, a frontotemporal dementia patient will not appreciate that she has a point of view and will state that she is going to go directly to the box. So this is a, a basic uh, way to test uh, patients uh, for theory of mind. Finally, I want to just uh, comment on the threat alarm system. Um, and I call it that. Uh, other people do as well. Uh, uh, David Amaral uh, at uh, UC Davis uh, has done uh, uh, great work on this uh, with uh, monkeys uh, has, uh, ablating the amygdala. It's all about the amygdala, by the way. Uh, in that anterior temporal region. And Ralph Adolph's at Caltech uh, in, uh, has studied this, particularly in patients with, who've had calcification in the amygdala, and uh, has shown that the, this, that region uh, is uh, disturbed uh, in terms of signaling a danger, a particular social danger. So those are some of the underlying mechanisms why there's disturbed social behavior in frontotemporal dementia. And uh, we can talk more about the mechanisms, and we can go on and on. But I think if you get an appreciation that such a th that that's the way it works. Okay, uh, let me finish uh, with a little bit on, uh, on morality and a few things, if I have time. Um, I did some uh, work on uh, morality a few years ago, which has uh, got got uh, a lot of uh, press and uh, dispress, unpress, uh, bad press. Um, and in fact, in another country, actually, somebody showed a picture of me uh, uh, embracing a chimp uh, and talking about how chimps have morality. It was meant to be dis disparaging, and um, the chimp was not offended. Um, so there are disturbances, and I got interested in this because uh, we had patients who were arrested when they had their behavior change. Um, they were arrested because there was unsolicited sexual approach, uh, traffic violations, hit and run accidents, physical assaults in a few patients, shoplifting, um, deliberate non-payment of bills, uh, pedophilia. Now, I have to uh, define this a little bit because it was uh, touching, rubbing, that kind of thing. Uh, it wasn't anything beyond that. But the, the point is that... Uh, because of their disease, they had no, no uh, inhibition about approaching somebody else's child and uh, touching them inappropriately. Uh, and uh, I had two that uh, went to jail. Um, I, oh, and for the shoplifting, I had one that uh, went to state prison. And uh, actually, she was brought to us at UCLA on discharge uh, with, uh, you know, uh, after the prison doctors concluded that there must be a brain disease. Um, indecent exposure in public, urinating in inappropriate public places. I have a patient in Beverly Hills uh, who lives in a huge house and he likes to uh, go out in the front lawn and 
very disruptive to the neighborhood. <laughs> Stealing food, eating food in grocery store stalls because there's a hyper uh, oral tendency, breaking and entering in, into uh, others' uh, homes. Um, now, um, this region, when uh, this is uh, Jorge Moll in uh, Rio de Janeiro, who's done great work on, uh, uh, on morality with fMRI studies, uh, looking at where uh, regions of the brain, if you had to put uh, a pinpoint region of the brain that might be affected, and again, we're looking at the ventromedial region, that part of the brain that I showed you is affected in this illness. Um, Joshua Green, uh, who's now at Harvard, uh, then came up with two moral codes of conduct, personal and impersonal, uh, showing that personal moral behavior was particularly disturbed in these patients. Um, and this is exempl exemplified by the trolley car uh, dilemma. I don't know if you've, you're familiar with this, are you, the trolley car dilemma? So you, here you have uh, a runaway trolley that may kill five workers. Fortunately, you can flip a switch, which will lead the trolley down a second track you're standing next to the switch. Unfortunately, this will kill a large man who has fallen on the second track, but guess what? You'll save uh, a net for humans. How many of you would flip the switch? So that's interesting. Up in uh, LA County, a lot more people would flip the switch. <laughs> um, so the alternative is uh, the following. A runaway trolley may kill five workers. Fortunately, you're standing on a footbridge next to a large man. Sometimes, uh, instead of, uh, this man is described as having a huge backpack. Uh, uh, but the point is, if you push him and his backpack on the tracks, his body is large enough to stop the trolley. So here's a guy, he's standing, you're looking, him, you're looking at him in the eye, you know, he's a big guy. Uh, you, you're, you're feeling his uh, humanness. And, uh, how many of you would push the guy over? You'd still have a... So uh, the normal response is to pull the switch. The abnormal response, uh, well, the, not, the response that most people don't do is to push the man, yet the net result is the same. Uh, now, uh, we've done many studies on this and other uh, dilemmas, moral dilemmas, and uh, uh, in general, the FTD patients have no problem pushing the man. They re reason it out. They don't have the feelings, like I said earlier, the social feelings, uh, but they reason it out in a ut utilitarian fashion, uh, uh, John uh, Mills, uh, Stuart Mills uh, fashion, utilitarian, uh, the, the greater good for the greater many. And this is the result, uh, I won't go through this. And uh, just in my last few slides, um, we did, some, we did a study once uh, that you might be interested in on uh, people in the uh, caricaturists in the entertainment industry and uh, who developed uh, this illness. There were four of them. And uh, how their caricatures changed over time. So uh, the first picture on the left is a pre-morbid caricature. Remember, this is of another human in front of them exaggerating their features, which is what a caricature is. And as time went on, the caricature gradually changed so that the last one, while they were in, he was in the hospital and drawing the guy in the next bed, uh, you can see that he had no sense of what, who this person was as a human. Uh, in other words, the, the, the human was not there. The alienness was there. Uh, we also did a morphing study uh, with uh, movie clips showing a change in behavior a change in recognition, where, what point they recognize something as human uh, versus uh, um, an animal, a comparable animal. And again, they had difficulty making the distinction. Uh, we do uh, psychophysiologic measures uh, in our laboratory. We've been focusing on various uh, social stimuli, pleasant, unpleasant stimuli. Uh, and uh, this is again from uh, 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 Gazaniga's textbook showing uh, the fact that uh, usually these patients have no reactivity to these unpleasant stimuli. So um, I want to conclude then uh, with uh, ho hopefully the point I'm, I've made the point that there's disturbance in the social brain, particularly in behavioral variant FTD. That's what characterizes it, and you have to be aware of it. That's mainly what I can do today for you is to make you aware of it and to describe some of the underlying uh, mechanisms. Uh, and then I might just uh, note that uh, management uh, 
is uh, complicated. Uh, we, uh, my partner and I, which I should mention, my partner is Jill Shapira, uh, whom I've worked with uh, for many years in our program. Uh, she's become a master at this, and we, and using uh, non-pharmacologic uh, interventions, uh, 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 judicious uh, use of uh, psychoactive uh, medicines, and I, I use psychoactive medicines, um, and uh, frankly, uh, I think I help people with them. Um, individual people, careful monitoring, carefully chosen patients. Um, okay, so this is our group. And uh, again, just, just to note, my partner, mo most important person on the list is probably Jill. Um, thank you very much. I think we have time for... Okay, we have time for a few questions from the audience. So while we're waiting, I'll ask a question. Uh, what's the percentage of FTD cases that exhibit the behavioral variant versus those that don't? Um, in a uh, combined study that we did with UCSF and uh, with Munich, uh, Dr. Deal Schmidt in Munich, uh, it's, it's about 50 percent. It's pretty close to 50, 52, 53 percent, something like that, uh, of all the frontotemporal lobar degenerations are the behavioral variant. Oh, pretty high. Okay. There's a question back there. Uh, hi. Thank you very much. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, behavioral strategies that you've employed in the clinic to help people. Um, <clears throat> one of the first things I, I do is uh, discuss uh, what the social brain is about and put it in the context of uh, frontal executive abilities in the frontal lobes. And uh, it really, once you have that discussion, if you spend some time with uh, patients and families, uh, all, of, all of a sudden the world changes. And uh, be, because up to then uh, there's been a lot of, there's a lot of blame, a lot of guilt. Um, attribution error, this attribution error of it's the patient's fault that he doesn't care about me anymore, doesn't, uh, isn't involved, isn't engaged, uh, is doing these, these terrible things. Uh, and once they realize that it's not his or her fault, it becomes a, a totally different world. And, you know, they often at that point burst into tears and, oh my God, and I've been blaming them. And uh, then they become much more accepting. Uh, then after that, uh, there's the issue of informing uh, close family members and, and friends uh, about the person's behavior and brain disease, and the tolerance grows. I mean, that, that's a big step. Uh, the, a, a lot of what, the other things that we do is to um, have the family be the patient's frontal lobes for them decision-making, uh, judgment, uh, monitoring, self-monitoring, patient monitoring, and so on. Thank you, thank you. Let's uh, thank Dr. Mendez again.